My name is Brandy Bajlia, and I'm super excited to be here with all of you. Um, it's a great opportunity. I am a multimedia artist, uh, currently sort of working more in installation and socially engaged work. Um, a little bit about me, I feel like my work is very personal, but I also think it relates to everyone. I am from Birmingham, Alabama. My family is from Ramallah, which is a city in Palestine. So I feel like violence is something very connected to sort of my history when I think about those two places. Um, and my work currently, I can say, is um, really speaking to um, a, a traditional Palestinian textile um, of embroidery called Tatrice. So a lot of my work right now has been about weaving. It's been about cross-stitching. It's been about sort of these historical motifs and this uh, ancient, this really amazing practice that's sort of vanishing, right? Um, my most recent piece that I've worked on having to do with this um, was a site-specific piece at Teachers College, Columbia University, uh, where I was weaving in, into a, a, a large grate with a sort of industrial rope using motifs that I learned from my teta. So a lot of diamond shapes that connect. Um, for me, I, I like to work in the public and I like to make things that are sort of big and spectacular and aesthetically like pleasing to the eye because I feel like it draws on a really large audience. So I'm definitely focused on making work that sort of utilizes something that someone told me about a couple of years ago and I'm seeing it in my work more often is soft power. So making work that um, at first glance is just really beautiful using things like, um, you know, uh, string and um, textile, very soft materials, flowers, things that are soft and feminine and fragile, appear to be fragile, and actually speaking to something really large. Um, and you really don't acknowledge it until you get super close and sort of start digging in. So that's what this piece was about. It's titled uh, Habiti, which is um, in Arabic means like my darling, my sweetheart, and it's kind of just a term of endearment. Um, and then also with this piece, there is a um, sound installed underneath the grates, and it was a sound piece composed by my partner, um, which focuses on different sounds layering, so also mimicking uh, what it is to weave with sound. So when you would encounter this piece, not only was it this big you know, weaving structure, but also sound coming out of it. Uh, so that's a recent piece of mine. Um, yeah, I think that seems good. My name is Williamson Brassfield. I'm an artist um, who mostly works in painting and sound. Um, the work, a lot of different projects, but the work that I was thinking most connects to this topic is a series of paintings that I started uh, for a show at Alejandro's Gallery in Nicaragua, uh, where I took the stencils for a uh, for that they sell to cam to camouflage weapons um, and use them as a sort of a source for abstract paintings um, I'd been thinking for the past few years about this idea of abstraction as camouflage or like a method of kind of of hiding or obfuscating certain sources or source materials and um, also thinking about the history of abstraction as sort of a political tool. In the 1960s, of course, like a lot of the international shows of the abstract expressionists were underwritten by the CIA and this sort of uh, condition of, of art that's supposedly non-objective is kind of having these sort of secret histories or currents and also thinking too about the idea of paintings as um, sort of commodities and the idea of where money for paintings can come from. And particularly thinking about um, like early in the Trump presidency, I remember a number of artists were stunned and shocked that their art was in Trump's collection. And uh, they were like, how did this happen? And it's like, well, that's how, how art sometimes is consumed. You don't really have a choice of where it goes. So I was thinking of all of these, these sort of histories and just, also, in a more per on a p more personal level, um, I, d I never met my grandfather, but he was a, a veteran of several major American wars. And uh, he, um, when he got back from Korea, he 
bought a Jaguar for himself and then decided he didn't like the color. And so he repainted it with, uh, he, he made it halfway around the car, but he repainted it with like little testers enamels. And I thought about that as like, you know, the way that paint and violence and tragedy and all of that can come, to, come in to these sort of almost tick-like gestures. Um, and as a way to sort of meditate on the fact that I'm like the first, one of the first men in my family to not be in the army and not to be in this sort of ultra-masculine culture. Um, yeah, it just is sort of almost like a meditative way to think about uh, a lot of different histories and layers. My name is Mildred Beltry. And when I was first, I guess, asked about this topic to think about um, uh, interventions into violence through art, um, I, I thought of two things. And so I have a dual practice, I guess. So one is a studio-based practice. And I'll talk about that first. So in my studio-based work, something that I've been thinking about a lot with my work is um, the idea is, is I guess, revolutionary thought and revolutionary practice, but how that looks like in intimate spaces. And so, you know, so, you know, often revolution is thought of as something like it goes out in the street and it's very loud, but what happens between people um, is, is, I guess, what I'm interested in. So I'm exploring that through, and it was interesting hearing you talk about your work, Brandy. I think there's some connections materially. Um, so one way, is I've been making these um, tapestries that have these sort of revolutionary slogans or jokes sometimes too, but there's also like a little bit of a sexual overtone or undertone to them. Um, and so thinking about how it is, how revolution and desire sort of commingle, you know, or, or how those things come together in intimate spaces. Um, and also thinking of like, you know, like what's the emotional life of a revolutionary, right? Like how does it affect the possibility for finding love or, you know, things like that? Or, you know, what does it look like as you're going to bed, you know? Um, so that's one part of my practice. And then the other intervention I was thinking about was I have a collaborative practice um, with another artist, Oisa Duvernay, and we, started out a project where, so we lived in the same building for 20 years, and about 10 years ago, we started making art together, just in our apartments, and we would have conversations, and we thought that it was, that through, you know, through making and talking, we sort of, I don't know, sort of moved or interacted with each other in a different way, and we thought, well, what would happen if we took this outside to our neighbors, and we were both very much coming from, um, you know, a, a, a teaching artist sort of practice as well, you know, so we thought what ha would happen if we did these art workshops on the street. Um, and so in 2010, we just took out a table and a tent and art materials and started inviting people to do stuff with us. And, you know, we found that people would come up to us and they'd be like, oh, what organization are you from? And we do this right in front of our building. And we're like, oh, we're not from any organization. We're just your neighbors. And I felt like that really changed how people saw what we were doing. Um, and so every year we go out there and do that. And then another way that the project's evolved is that we make these fence weavings. So um, there's a chain link fence on our block and we have been weaving different messages um, into the fence. Um, and it's really been a really interesting way to get to know people differently. People will be like, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? <laughs> Why does it say that? And so it just opens up all these possibilities for having discussions with people. And I guess, you know, just to linking it to the theme, one of the themes that we work with is this idea of gentrification and how gentrification is really, um, you know, it's violence against people of color and violence against poor people. And that one way that it works is that it really isolates people from one another. And it also... Um, creates a lot of mistrust and, you know, also causes a lot of over-policing and makes it so that people of color can't be on the street, you know? So part of the idea of the project is to bring people, have people be on the street, have people, um, you know, be able to have conversations on the street and make that like a generative and creative place 
to be and like, you know, take back some space on the street. My name is Arnaldo Morales. My work is like sculpt like intera interactive uh, sculptures. You're supposed to uh, uh, stand right here, put your back over this, mm -hmm. like this, you know, and play with this. I have cases where people physically punch me because they, they get really scared or they get, you know, a little hurt or something. Don't be nervous. Okay. okay. <laughs> Here is how you control, okay? <laughs> I've been working with the theme of violin for, for a little, t a li like a little time. Not a little time, but... Uh, I start. I started my work by making by because I uh, uh, with a concept of like making like an interactive uh, object for the public, and then I start with mixing my work with my environment. Uh, at first, uh, I I used to I used to do. Uh, you know, like maybe like a work that it, it was, you know, like powered by light, by electricity, by, by water. But then I start like challenging the Orient with it. I, I, I tr and try to push or maybe, uh, I don't know, motivate anyone who uh, co co uh, try to uh, uh, get close to my work. So in 2003, I make a show in response of uh, Bush war the, the, in, in, in Afghanistan, the first one after 9-11, called Weapons of Mass Seduction. And I built uh, like 24 sex toys, uh, but, but more in a sense of uh, weapons, because the, the the war, I think the war was called a uh, weapon, you know, the concept was called weapons of mass, destru uh, mass destruction, you know, uh, and I, and I, and I twist, twist it with the weapons of mass seduction. So I did, a, I did like a, like a, like a, maybe like a between kind of a, a demonstration of, of sex toys and then, uh, like like two models uh, demonstrating the work to to the people in the show. What I would like to combine with this conversation is a, is a show that I'm making right now. Uh, well, I've been working for a, uh, for for a few years. The idea, and is and it's about the the police uh, enforcement to black and brown people and maybe. Uh, the bystanders that get in between. <laughs> but uh, I've been making these nice sticks, these dancing nice sticks, that is related with maybe when you see a movie from the 50s, a, a police in a, par in a parade playing with a nice stick. You know, the nice stick will have like a, like, a li like a little stream and they will play and look at the people. At the, and, at the, and at the same time, you, you will see the Mayoret, uh, you know, marching, doing almost the same thing. So I'm trying to combine that concept with what is happening now, which doesn't match. But I'm but I'm working with this I'm working with this concept because it's a problem. It's an ongoing problem that in, instead of uh, stop because it's being watched, is is increasing, and is. And there's and and we all know that it, there's something wrong about, you know the, you know in the in the way the police are are trained to interact with people. My name is Alejandro La Guerra. Uh, I'm from Nicaragua. Uh, I come from Managua. My works, yeah, it's about the uh, investigation about the aesthetic of the power. Alejandro de la Guerra es uno de los artistas nicaragüenses que llevó su creatividad hasta Costa Rica como parte de la décima bienal centroamericana. El nicaragüense presentó en el evento Juegos de Guerra en Loop, una obra que habla de los ciclos del poder y la conquista. El proyecto consistió en un carrusel de escala real que el público podía interactuar, dándole vuelta para que gire. 
Según de la guerra, el carrusel fue un invento bélico para enseñarles a los soldados a matar a la caballería y viceversa. Si hacían la técnica, le daban vuelta al carrusel hasta que se lograra el objetivo. I am make a performance and a sculpture and I am working with a monument and I am make uh, some intervention in the monuments uh, with my body and, and also I have a performance that uh, I shot with the slingshot uh, with uh, monuments but uh, with a uh, Cuarzos and crystal, you know. The other works is uh, about La Caída was uh, when the revolution Sandinista bo born in 1979. Uh, it was uh, the, the people falling the, the monument uh, of the dictator Somoza. And that, that image for me was very, very present in my mind the history, you know, so I thought that will be a good idea to make another uh, uh, per another sh show or performance or monument to, to take uh, uh, the dictador uh, in, that in that moment, in this moment we have uh, other dictators. Uh, so I made uh, a sculpture like a uh, Very, uh, it's a replica and invite to people to, to fall in the, the monument. This process was very interesting uh, because I work with, uh, with some uh, sculpture people that uh, working with the government, you know? They make uh, the symbols of the, or the symbols of the government, you know? So for me it was a good idea to invite the people and construct, and to make a, a the sculpture with this guy um, and after falling, you know. The other project was, uh, the name is La Piñata. La Piñata was, uh, is the name that the people say for after the revolution uh, that, that, that lost the government of the revolutionaries. Uh, they take some bienes, the good, yeah, for, yeah. And, And the people say this la piñata, you know, because it's like uh, the symbology that you you invite your friends for <laughs> you brought the, the the symbol and after you take. So for me, that that is the the, the topic that the people don't 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 talk, you know, in Nicaragua because it's mm -hmm. it's like a taboo. So I make a big uh, a piñata, invite two people to, to, to come into the performance, but uh, I change the, the roles, no? The people all the time was like uh, with... Uh, Blindfold. And they don't, 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 don't see the, the performance, only to, to listen. And so it was very violent and very sensitive that I broke the piñata and the people don't, don't see the, the project, you know, the process. It's funny, when I was in like, a, not high school, but middle school or something, uh, in school, a pi for us in Puerto Rico, a piñata is when, uh, una piñata, right? It's when your friends beat you up uh, in a friendly way Like the, you know, for a little while, and then we, we all we all still friends. Yeah. <laughs> That they pick you, and you know. Yeah. So let's talk about your work, <laughs> because I I feel working with violin is to me is easier than working when than trying to make something peaceful. Uh, Sometimes I try to do something peaceful and, and I find that it's impossible for me to do it. I mean, I like, for example, uh, to provoke, to, to, to confront, to, let, let's say, to maybe to even to make you happy, but even in a, in a, in a aggressive way, in, in, some, in some ways. Or it's inciting, but, like, yeah, like, like inciting. Yeah. Or, you know, like, um, 
But making something peaceful, try, uh, making something peaceful means that you maybe have to leave it, it, your state of mind. Have to be like uh, you may you, like, like almost trying to train yourself to, to be that way. You know, like try to behave uh, calm. Try to uh, whatever you make. You know, with some. Um, you know, in a delicate way, for example. And I, and I, and I feel like, it, I mean, it's interesting to me because it's uh, all, you know, uh, all we live in right now as, as, as a society is like, you know, is like open Facebook uh, and then see these violent images. Uh, and then we, we get almost like uns unsensitized to it. You know, like uh, almost like uh, like used to it to see s so much violence and not not responding, not, you know, we don't cry. We don't we just see it. And so sometimes we laugh about it. I mean, not me, but I was thinking like the I remember I saw a work of yours that was the prison trays, I think uh, the metal plates, the, they are trays right from. Yeah, that, they're the, like the dining, di commercial dining. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and the sound of it was just so like intense and um, and aggressive and visually it was like scary to, to look at it. And I was thinking about that as what you were saying, like the opposite of sort of something like painting, right? Which is sort of inherently very quiet. That's like one of the inherent properties of painting in a way is its silence. And then the, that machine sort of has this as an inherent property, this like very aggressive sound and very physical immediacy. Um, and sort of, yeah, and that it, painting does often create a space where it invites contemplation. It invites a sort of almost uncanny silence. And uh, yeah, and like harnessing that is very tricky because it, cause it can be mute and it, and it can be sort of whatever the audience wants, wants it to be. It can you know, be above your couch and it's fine, you know, and it could be like a Goya or something where people are getting shot and it's just. Yeah, I think but Goya is more violent than me in some kind yeah, of yeah, way, yeah. you know. <laughs> it, it, you know, like, it's like looking at people in a meat grinder or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, that, pe that piece was more related to the, I, I studied in public school uh, in the island. I came here when I was like 28. Uh, so I, I grew up over there, and those traits were, were the ones that I used from first grade to high school. So to me, I mean, I know uh, they, they, they're used everywhere, like, you, know, you know, schools, prisons, whatever. But uh, to me, it was more about the, you know, an object that it was so familiar to me. I actually find your work to be super interesting as well for the exact opposite reason, right? So um, I, I think about this a lot right after the election. I went to this artist talk and there was sort of this discussion about like what do we do as artists, you know, after this like horrific thing has happened that will continue to be horrible for a very long time, right? And the answer was sort of like you do what you do, right? We don't, we can't just change the way that we make work. We make it in response to these things, whether it's quiet, whether it's loud, whether it's violent or nonviolent or whatever that is. And I think that ultimately, like, you and I have very different approaches to that, which I think is really important to have, like, two different angles to come at this from. For me, I feel like, you know, um, especially after the election, before the election as well, but especially after the election, something was triggered in me where I was like, I can only take in so much of this and this can't come out in my work. I have to make work that counters what I'm experiencing and what I'm feeling. And I think that was sort of my offering as an artist was like, how can I make safe spaces? Like, no one feels safe. <laughs> how can I make spaces that are safe? <laughs>
But how can I talk about something that I care about? You know, and for me, I think about, you know, Palest when I think about Palestine, which is something I'm very familiar with and grew up understanding a lot about, um, and I follow uh, pretty pretty closely. It's something that in the United States we don't talk about. We don't talk about Palestine. We and never talk about Palestine. So I was like, okay, th there's something that I can talk about that I know well that I can infuse in my work. This is it. You know, this is something I care about. But I also think it's super important to make work that's violent. I think that I think there's also something to that. And like for me, when I saw your work, I was attracted to using these like really heavy, potentially dangerous objects because I would never go for those items. Like that's not something I would pick up. But I'm really intrigued by how that's utilized and what that makes you feel when you experience it. And um, I definitely think that there's something about your work that um, when you feel it, you do sort of feel shook. You don't really know what's going to happen. You're kind of almost a little bit scared of what might happen to you next, especially with these like sort of moving mechanical objects. So I think that's really powerful. Thank you. I mean, my work for me is, is more like a, my own therapy. Yeah. Well, I mean, something that I was thinking about, I mean, just in this conversation, was that idea of like you know tearing things down versus building, right? So that if you're if you're thinking about things that you'd like to change. Um, or are you thinking about all the things that are wrong or hard or, you know, distracting or have us like completely numb, you know, like how do you work towards dismantling those things while at the same time figuring out, okay, if that goes away, what's, what do we have, you know, or how do you start to think about what it is that you want or what it is that you want things to be like or look like or whatever, you know, so I was, there's this um, book that's been really important to my work. It's Freedom Dreams by Robin D.G. Kelly, you know, and he talks about the power of the imagination and the imagination as a political work and as important political work because, you know, one of the things that oppression does is limit our ability to dream, you know, so that you can only imagine what's already happening and you can't think about, you know, something else. So it seems like that those things are, it seems like all of that is sort of like at play, I think, in a lot of the things that we've been saying. Thank you.